Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Pathway Online. Uh, I say this every time, but we are so glad that you decided to join us for church today. We love being able to gather together as an online family and connecting online. I don't know if you're going to use the chat feature or anything like that this morning. We definitely encourage you to do so. Uh, but thank you for being here. I've got a couple announcements for you to kick things off this morning. And the first one is we want to let you know about our Pathway Kids Advent Calendar. So you're watching online. Your kids also have a Pathway Kids online option as well, if you didn't already know. So you go to pathwaycc.net slash kids. There's videos, there's devos, different things like that for your kids to interact with. But this holiday season, we've added an Advent calendar, which is a great way for your family to interact with Advent throughout the month of December. Uh, so again, just go to that same website. You can download it. You can use the digital version, whatever works best for you guys. Now, last week, we let you know about a new event that was coming up, but we really didn't say anything about it. We just said that it was going to happen on December 18th. I now get to tell you all of the things about it, except I'm still not going to tell you all the things about it because there's a lot of things to know. I'm going to give you the very brief, brief overview of the event, and then you can head to the website, you can go to the app, and you can check out all the details. Okay, so here it is. We are throwing a Christmas expedition on December 18th, and it's going to be between 4.30 and 7.30. So you're allowed to come anytime in there and take part in the event. And this event is kind of like a driving scavenger hunt, except scavenger hunt isn't a sufficient way to explain it. But in a very short way, you are going to stop at different locations. You're going to collect gifts and prizes and treats, and you're going to explore Winkler. You're going to be able to see the lights, and it's just kind of a fun game for you guys to get out. Uh, and have a great time this Christmas season. So all you have to do to be ready for that event is you need to reserve a vehicle pass. So you're going to go to the app to do that, uh, or you can go to the web page that we have on our website. You can also go to the news page. The information is there as well. Basically, anywhere that you get information, it's already there, and we are so excited about this event. There's a ton more details to explain what's going on, so we're going to leave it for you to read and catch up on all that information. But the Christmas expedition is coming your way very soon, so sign up. Now, the last thing I wanna let you know about is giving a pathway. Now, there's a lot of different ways that you can partner with us in helping us extend the mission of those far from God come to know life in Christ. But one of those ways is by giving financially, and if that's something that you would like to partake in this morning, uh, then there's a lot of different ways for you to do that. There's a few online giving options. Uh, you can send an e-transfer, you can set up online banking uh, and make uh, payments that way, or you can pay with PayPal on our website. So for all that information and any assistance, visit us at pathwaycc.net slash give. All right, I'm done talking for now. Let's go spend some time in worship. So come and join us.
became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness he humbled himself and carried the cross love so amazing love so Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sin.
Well, good to see everyone here today as we are carrying on in our series on foretold, looking at different prophecies in the Old Testament that relate to uh, the coming of Jesus, the advent of God doing something new in the New Testament. Today we're going to be looking at John the Baptist and the prophecies that have to do with him because he's an important figure within our story. He's the one who comes before the coming of the Lord. And so we need to look at him. He's a prominent figure even within the story of the birth of Jesus because I don't know how many of you know this, but John the Baptist is actually Jesus' first cousin. And they're roughly around six months separating them in age. So they're actually around the same age, which is kind of a neat thing as well. If you got your Bibles with you, I want you to turn with me to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. I'm going to be looking at verses 1 to 4. And if you don't know where the book of Isaiah is, in the beginning of your Bible, there is a table of contents. People worked really hard to put it there. Do not be ashamed to use it. Again, when using it, you will become more familiar with the things uh, in your Bible, where they are located. And so it is there as a helpful tool. So please use it. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1 to 4. Here's what it says. Comfort my people, says, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and, and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed and that her sin has been paid for and that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain hill be made low, and the rough ground shall become level, and the rugged places plain. Let's pray together. Lord God, I thank you so much for our time together here, and I pray, Lord, that as we're looking into your word, that we would have a deeper understanding of some of the prophetic things that are happening in the Old Testament that point us towards the New Testament. And Lord, specifically as we're looking at John the Baptist, I pray, Jesus, that this would be a launching pad to study even further the life of John the Baptist so that we understand at a deeper level what it meant for him to be a forerunner for Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. So I mentioned we're going to be talking about John the Baptist this uh, in this particular message, but in order to be able to do that, in order to be able to talk about the prophecy that relates to John the Baptist, which is the one that most people are familiar with, right? Like the voice crying out in the wilderness, we're familiar with that, but in order for that piece to make sense, we have to look at its context and we have to look at what comes before it. So Isaiah 40, uh, the prophet gives us this famous prediction, of course, of the voice crying out in the wilderness. We know that the voice in the wilderness is John the Baptist, and he was incredibly laser-focused in his ministry. Now, one could say that that, um, he's just not a guy who was able to get derailed from what it was that he was intended to do in terms of his ministry. He just knew he was sent to prepare the way for the one that would come after him. Now, in our context, we're looking at this prophecy that is given to Israel, given to uh, Israel in a time when they are coming under some affliction. We see them coming under the affliction of the Assyrian Empire at this point. This is right before the Babylonian Empire. And and the Assyrians were, uh, they were difficult to deal with, but, but they were still able to function as a people. And what we find here is that there is this language of hope that is present here. In verse 1 it says, Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. And so the previous 39 chapters, Isaiah is giving a lot of really negative news, even though there's some hope within it as well. But we find a shift taking place starting in Isaiah chapter 40. And so from Isaiah chapter 40 all the way to the end of the book of Isaiah, you begin to see a more hopeful message than there is a disciplinary message. It's full of comfort and blessing and full of the glory of God. Comfort, yes, comfort my people, he says. Isaiah knew that it was to, what it was to warn and instruct the people of God, but the Lord also wanted him to offer comfort. He wanted his people to not just experience discipline, to experience the comfort that comes from his presence with them. It's an important thing for those 
hurting hearts to hear a word of comfort from God's messenger. I actually heard a preacher say it this way once. Preach to the brokenhearted and you'll never lack an audience. Preach to the brokenhearted and you'll never lack an audience. There is this shattered heart in Israel at this time. And God says to them, there is comfort that is coming. Speak comfort to Jerusalem, verse 1. It means that Jerusalem needed a word of comfort. It means that God had comfort to give them. And God's comfort isn't this hollow, positive thinking of like there's a silver lining in every storm cloud. That's not the kind of comfort we're referring to here. The kind of comfort we're referring to here is one that gives this hope, this trust, this um, unyielding sense of God's goodness in amidst what they were dealing with, his comfort. And the word comfort actually comes with tender words. And the language of tender words here is, is a language of a, a deep heart-to-heart connection. There's a tenderness, there's a you could say that it's a bit more of a nurturing language. It's the kind of language that you would offer to a very, very young child that, you know, maybe their best friend moved away and they needed comfort because their hearts are broken. It's that kind of nurturing language. And so he says, speak words of comfort. And the words of comfort that begin to get spoken are profound. In the NIV, it says, speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her service has been completed. And the language of her service has been completed. Some translations say it this way. They say that your battle is your ending, your warfare has ended, your service is completed is a similar kind of language. And so your labor against your enemies has come to an end. And this is spoken to a people where battle was still looming. Battle was still taking place. But the notion of the war was finished. It may very well have been a prophetic word, of course, even though there was still an army against them. As far as the people of God were concerned, Judah's warfare was ended. In other words, the ultimate war is finished. You're coming on the other side of this, and you're going to be coming back to Jerusalem You're going to end up being okay. And not only that, something in the future is coming that's going to take away all of your despair for eternity. Judah's warfare has ended. There was reason for comfort. God always gives reason for comfort. And in the same sense, God speaks to us and he tells us that we can be more than conquerors through he who loves us. It's the same kind of language. Romans chapter 8, verse 37, right? Uh, Leading up to verse 37, it's this idea of that Jesus intercedes on our behalf. There's nothing that can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, right? And so then we have all of this, and then in the end of all of this, even, you know, in, in verse 36, it says, as it is written, for your sake we face death all day long and considered as sheep to be slaughtered. And so there's accusations, there's harshness, there's harsh realities in terms of what people are experiencing. And in the midst of that, he says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. In other words, the battle still looms, but the war ultimately is finished. You see, for the believer in Jesus, our warfare is ended and the battles we still have, but the ultimate war is finished because Jesus conquered death. Jesus conquered sin. We are able to come into the throne room. We have access to God. We have salvation. That ultimate war, well, it's been won. There's comfort from God in this. In referencing false prophets and the spirits associated with them, John uh, the, the disciple whom Jesus loved in 1 John verse four, uh, chapter 4, verse 4 says this, You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than he that is in the world. 
And so here he's talking about uh, the spirits and, and the false teachers associated with these spirits that are trying to lead people away from understanding um, the actual incarnation of Jesus. And, and in, even in this, they're more than conquerors. The believer has already accepted the, the believer that has already accepted the truth about Jesus. And be, sorry, the believer has already accepted the truth about Jesus, and because of this, through the power of the Holy Spirit, the child of God overcomes the deceit of the false teachers and the spirits associated with them. We are more than conquerors. And so it's not this idea that the battles are gone. The battles are still there, but that ultimate war, it's finished. It's won. It's complete. And God's offering Israel this kind of language back then prior to talking about the one who is going to be the forerunner for the Messiah. And then he says this, continuing on and comforting his people. In verse 2, it's the idea here that their sin is pardoned. In verse 2, it says, And proclaim to her that her heart service has been completed. And then it says that her sin has been paid for. Has been pardoned. Jerusalem was aware of her sin. Isaiah made made Jerusalem acutely aware of her sin. And yet the prophet speaks of a day when comfort can be offered because the sin will be cleansed. The sin will be taken away. To be recognized as a sinner as one having inequity and yet knowing that your inequity is pardoned this is reason for comfort Jerusalem knew that she sinned against God knew it and to know that she sinned against God and yet God moves on behalf of Jerusalem to pardon Jerusalem's sin is a comfort sound familiar within Christianity We come to God and and we know that there are things in our lives that shouldn't be there. We know that there is this sin within us. There there are things that we do on a regular basis that for whatever reason we have a habit of doing it. There are things that we choose to do that disobey God. We know that the ways we interact with people are sometimes ways that are not God honoring. We are a people who sin and yet even within that, God pardons our sin through the blood of Jesus Christ. That when we seek forgiveness, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins. What an amazing comfort. You see, we're not a perfect people. This is the interesting thing. I had a conversation once with one of my closest friends. We were out for supper, and, uh, and, and he was talking about how frustrated he was with Christianity. That we say one thing, we do another, and, and we're, it's all hypocrisy. We've all heard this kind of language before. And so I just asked him a very simple question. I asked him, why is it that you're holding me to a standard that you don't hold yourself to? Why is it that you're telling me that there are things I believe that I don't always follow through on, but you refuse to look at the things you believe that you don't always follow through on? You see, Christianity is not about a people who are perfect in their actions. We are a people who are pardoned in our actions. That's the only real difference. We've accepted Jesus, and because of his work on the cross, we're forgiven and we have access to the throne. We're not the ones who make the difference between the believer and the unbeliever. Jesus is. And otherwise... It's level ground at the foot of the cross. All of it. We read here also that she has received from the Lord double for all her sins and at the end of verse 2. Double for all her sins. And it declares the basis of the pardon of the, towards the sin. The sin has been completely paid for. Isaiah is speaking in Old Covenant terminology. It's old legal language, actually. It's a language that we're not familiar with. We don't use. Um, But it's Old Covenant uh, terminology. It speaks of of Jerusalem bearing the curse of disobedience. In passages like Leviticus 26 or Deuteronomy 28, 
But the same principle applies to the believer under the new covenant. Our sin is pardoned because our sin has been paid for. And this is a reason for comfort. And this double, it's not actually the idea that God paid twice. It's not the idea that I want us to understand. It's this idea of like to double over, to fold over. And so then the the egregiousness of the sin is folded over, right, by the thing that pardons it, and the thing that pardons it is sufficient to cover that iniquity, that sin. That's the idea of double. That's the meaning here. Each half corresponds exactly with the other half, and this would yield the thought of the exact correspondence between sin and its payment, right? So, so whatever the sin is, the payment is able to cover completely that sin. That's what's being talked about here. The payment's been made, and it's the exact payment that was needed. This is the context that comes before the language of the forerunner to the Christ. What we have is the comfort of God to the people who are being told that your sin's going to get taken care of and it's going to take care of being taken care of completely and it's going to be taken care of with the appropriate measures that are needed in order for it to be taken care of and that's going to come in the form of the Messiah. And before the Messiah comes, we have verse 3. In verse 3, it says, A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Isaiah writes about a person in a desert who prepares a way for the Lord. It's this prophecy foreshadows the life of John the Baptist who played an important role in preparing the groundwork for the ministry of Jesus. Jesus was born shortly after John. We know that when when Mary was initially pregnant with Jesus, she went to go and visit Elizabeth. Elizabeth was six months along in her pregnancy. And when Mary comes bearing Jesus in her womb, she comes over to Elizabeth. And you know what John the Baptist does? The language of the scripture is if John the Baptist is doing like somersaults, he's having a bit of a party in in Elizabeth's womb. So in the presence of Jesus, the forerunner of Jesus responds and is excited about what is to come. And this prophecy was written about these cousins, really. About 2,000 years ago, when these cousins walked the earth. The New Testament books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John include details about John the Baptist. Uh, John 1, for example, we're told that John the Baptist preached in the desert of Judea and he baptized Jesus. In John chapter 1, verse 29 to 34, says this The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look, The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Do you remember the prophecy to Jerusalem back in Isaiah chapter 40? The idea of taking away the sins of the world? This is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. And then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him. But the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. And so John the Baptist announces that Jesus is the Son of God. And that he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In a very similar way, we find in Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. And I'm just going to highlight uh, verse 1. It's also viewed as being a prophecy about the forerunner of the the, uh, messenger, actually. The forerunner, a messenger who would prepare the way for the Messiah. Here's what he says. I will send my messenger who will prepare a way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. Catch that? The Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. 
And so how is the way of the Lord prepared? Right, so if we're talking about John the Baptist, and if we're talking about the prophecy in Isaiah that reveals John the Baptist's ministry, if we talk about the prophecy of Isaiah, and we understand that this is about sin being cleansed, and the forerunner is going to be proclaiming that the Messiah is coming to cleanse the sin of Israel, and of the, through Israel of the world, then it's fair to say that the way prepared, the way of preparing, is repenting. The way of preparing is repenting. John was proclaiming, like a voice crying out in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, a baptism of repentance. Now, through Judaism, through Judaism of the time, at the time, and various uh, stages in, in their history, what we find is a lot of ritual washing that takes place. It's part of the Levitical laws that are in there. We find that there is ritual washing that is to take place. And it's interesting to note that people who were not Jewish, if they wanted to become Jewish, had to be baptized, had to have a ritual washing of immersion. It's interesting. John may be saying that even Jewish people need this kind of baptism to prepare for God. The Gentiles and Jews stand equally then and in need of forgiveness. You see, prior to this, what we found is that the Jewish community felt that the Gentiles were completely unclean. And so in the time of John the Baptist, when John the Baptist is baptizing Jewish people and saying, this is a baptism of repentance, why do you need to repent? Because you're unclean. There are things you're doing that need to be gotten rid of. You need to repent. Move 180 degrees in a different direction from where you are going. Move back towards God. And then at the same time, calling Gentiles into relationship with God and using the same mechanism. All, at that point, were considered unclean and in need of the same kind of forgiveness. In John's gospel, John the Baptist himself says that he is the fulfillment of Isaiah 40, verse 3 to 5. So Isaiah 40, verse 3 to 5, we've read already, uh, but John records what John the Baptist, these two different Johns, John, the apostle whom Jesus loved, records what John the Baptist says, and he's talking to a group of religious leaders that are coming along uh, to talk to him, specifically their priests, and this is an interesting thing to note. They're priests, and you need to know that John the Baptist, his dad, Zechariah, was one of the priests in the temple, which means John the Baptist is of the priestly order, and he is functioning right now outside of the temple in the form of a priest. He is serving in priestly duties. There is a baptism of repentance. He is calling people to uh, a relationship back to the Lord. There's a ceremony that is taking place in the process. And so you have priests talking to somebody else who's in the line of priests. He's the Levitical line. And he says, finally they say, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. So these are people who were sent by other authorities to figure out who John was because nobody really knew who John was. There was a bunch of speculation. So who are you? And they send this group of people to come and find out who he is. What do you say about yourself? And then verse 23, John replied, In the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice calling in the wilderness, make straight the way for the Lord. This is how John defines himself. John was being asked about his identity by a priestly delegation sent to meet him in this desert. And he refers them back to this prophecy from Isaiah. And in doing so, says, hey, listen, I know what you might be thinking, but I'm not the Messiah. I am not the Messiah, he's saying. Elijah, sorry, he's not the Messiah, he's not Elijah the prophet. If you want more information about that, you can look at the commentary that you'll find along with Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 to 6. Um, The language is that it's the spirit of Elijah, in the spirit of Elijah, in the manner of Elijah. It's not actually Elijah himself. Nor is he the prophet talked about in Deuteronomy 18. But they had to bring back a report, and so he goes back to Isaiah 40, and he says, listen, I'm the guy who's preparing the way for the Lord. Do you know what that means to them? When someone proclaims they are the forerunner of the Messiah, 
What they're saying is Messiah is coming. There are hundreds of years in between when this prophecy was announced and, and now where they're seeing the proclamation of this prophecy coming true. And he says, listen, I'm the forerunner. I'm the one coming. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight his path. He's coming. Do you know what kind of excitement would have erupted? What kind of concern potentially would have erupted? What kind of confusion may have erupted? This is not something to read and say, oh, okay, well, that's a nice story. It's just something to read and recognize that from this point forward, they're looking, they're anticipating, they're wondering. Was he a heretic? Was he just nuts? Or was he telling the truth? And if he was telling the truth... Oh, now you got something in Israel to be excited about. So they still press on and say, why, are you, why then are you baptizing anyone if you aren't the Messiah or Elijah or a prophet? And his response is to point beyond himself to Jesus. And though he doesn't mention him here by name, he is mentioning that he is merely the one who prepares the way. And he tells them, I am pre- I'm preparing things for him. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 4 says um, it's this idea when we're talking about the Messiah coming this, and the forerunner's message and what's taking place here. We've got some what you could call landscaping metaphors. Says, every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low, the rough ground shall be become level and the rugged places a plain. In other words, all kinds of obstructions are going to be removed from the path. All kinds of obstructions. In this language of repentance as part of the... Sorry, this is a language of repentance as part of preparing for the Lord's coming. The preparation is not about our enjoyment at Advent. It isn't. It's not about the celebration of Advent. The preparation isn't about the removal of guilt of our sins so that we can have free conscience in which we can celebrate Christmas. Though that is an incredible benefit that we receive from this. But it isn't its primary purpose. Not this particular message. The preparation is primarily about travel. It is. The highway is being prepared to meet with God. I mean, that's the language here, right? It says prepare in the desert a highway for the Lord, right? And so it's this idea of obstructions are going to get removed. And so it's this idea of keeping, making straight a highway, right? So why? So that if we're create, making sure that there's a straight highway between us and God, that he's able to get straight to us, Right? There's no deviations, there's no, there's no curves in the road or anything like that. There's no whys in the road. There's just a straight path to our hearts. Make straight a highway. If there's level ground, you can travel to us without any difficulty. Not only are there no weaving paths to us, there's also no rocky paths to us. And then finally, it's completely free of obstacles. There's no mountains, no hills, nothing's there. Nothing to climb to get to us. And it's the idea here that, that he's then able to move in our lives without hindrance. It's this, it's this idea of, of these things that are in our lives that are a result of the preparation that we have the privilege also beholding the glory of God. But the things that come along with that is that we're going to tear down every obstruction in our lives that hinders the Lord's ability, not ability, qualify, not, sorry, it, but it hinders the Lord's journey to us, to connect to us, because we've not prepared a way to receive him. That's the idea. That's the point of preparedness. Our hearts, are our hearts prepared for the Lord to meet with us? And what we find in verse 5 is that the glory of God is revealed. In verse 5, 
It says, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The glory of God can refer to his presence, his revelation, his name, his character, or his exalted state. But it's still all about him, and it's about how amazing he is. It is the recognition of God's worth, whether that be um, in our justification, in our sanctification, or in our glorification. You see, these are three big technical Christian words that all reference salvation. You see, justification is the idea that we have been saved, right? So we made a decision for Jesus, and we're saved upon calling on his name. We've made a decision for him. Sanctification is the process of becoming more and more like Jesus, and then glorification is what happens when we get into heaven. Every single one of these words is described as saved, And so the glory of God is revealed in our justification that we have been saved. The glory of God is revealed in the fact that we are being sanctified in our sanctification. It is the process of becoming more like Jesus. And the glory of God is revealed in our glorification, in our final state with him. In fact, it's the central concept in all aspects of our salvation. We can't forget that. And we've got to walk away from that dangerous thinking that our salvation is all about us. Mm-mm. It's all about him. It is for his name's sake that these things are happening. And so not only um, for the believer that this, glorif- this glory of God will be seen, but it's actually for everyone. It actually says that everyone together will see his glory. It reminds me of another passage. Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 to 11, it says that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every, sorry, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the, listen, glory of God the Father. Does that sound like everyone together to you? Every knee bow to the glory of God the Father. The glory of the Lord is revealed in the humble hearts of those who, in the hearts of those who humble themselves, removing self glory. You know, the internal and external sins that we have, that we're tending to prop ourselves up in some way, they got to be attacked. We have to be aggressive against these things. Hardened hearts got to be softened. Matthew Henry is a fairly well-known commentator who really wants to help people understand, especially within the Old Testament, how the gospel message is still weaved even within the Old Testament so that we can see it better. But he says that our hearts must be leveled by divine grace, and he talks about this in two ways. He says that those cast down into despair and the condemnation Uh, Sorry, those who are cast down in despair and condemnation are lifted up. That's That's one thing. That we see the divine grace shown in those cast down into despair and condemnation. They're lifted up. Right? Because we're no longer condemned when we're in Christ. So the condemned, those in despair, you're lifted. That's what grace does. But at the same time, there's there's some heart surgery taking place also in the people who are self-righteous. You see, we're humbled. That's what grace does. You see, grace points to the person who feels like they've got no hope, and they say, no, hang on a second. How arrogant of you to think you're so bad that my grace can't be sufficient for you. And we don't think of it as arrogance, and I don't mean to point fingers at anybody in that way, but consider for a moment the notion That me, a mere human being, is capable of doing something that the one who created out of nothing can't handle. There is this weird contention that we have with God on that one. 
And then at the same time, the person who feels they're self-righteous, what grace does is it points at them and says, ah, hang on a second, your measuring stick that you're using to determine your righteousness, you got this all wrong. You're looking at the people around you and you're saying, I'm not as bad as them. But your measuring stick, God says, is me. As long as I'm your measuring stick. My grace moves in your direction. And you're then able to see that your self-righteousness doesn't work. Because you don't have any. The only righteousness that we are given in order to be able to come before God is Christ's righteousness that's been given to us, imputed on us, poured all over us. In order that we come into the throne room and experience God. So the cast down into despair and condemnation are lifted. Those cast down. The self-righteous are humbled, all of us. And, and to be fair, we all fit into either one of those two things at any given point in life. There are times we feel condemned and cast down, and there are times that we, if we're honest with ourselves, we're self-righteous. We're self-righteous. We should be humbled, but not condemned. That's the idea. We're humbled, but we're not condemned. Whether you're filled with pride or in the depths of despair, we need to hear the voice calling you out of that frame of spirit. The state of preparedness that John calls people into is one that relies on hope and on faith. So here's some questions. What are the internal and external barriers to Christ's coming more fully in your life are you experiencing? Are you living life more for you than for him? Are you um, knowingly moving in a disobedient way? Are you unknowingly doing things? Are you hanging on to unforgiveness and bitterness? Are you, are you believing things about yourself that are just so completely untrue, but yet they immobilize you in terms of your ability to come to Jesus? Are you filled with fear, pride, or anger? Or maybe you've just always thought of yourself as independent and able to take care of yourself. And admitting that you have need is admitting failure. Let, let me encourage you with that one because that was me. The idea of needing other people, no, it didn't work for me. I learned at a very young age that I couldn't count on anyone. That was the lesson I learned growing up in an alcoholic, both parents' abusive home. Couldn't count on anybody else. So I became very self-reliant, very independent. And this idea that the gospel comes along and says, I couldn't, so he did, exposes my need. And I have to tell you, that made me really uncomfortable. It made me very uncomfortable. And then I realized that there was a weakness within me to think that I'm able to take care of everything on my own. So the weakness in me meant that I was partially connected to people. I was willing to be somebody they could lean on, but I would never lean on them. See, my sense of strength and independence actually showed, my, showed itself to be a relational weakness. When I understood that, I understood God a whole lot better. He wasn't trying to tell me I was weak. That wasn't his goal. He was trying to show me how strong he was. Like there was something, there, there was no hope for me being able to cover. And he says, no, nah, I got this for you. I got this. Whatever it is, this voice calls to you and it causes you or calls you to examine the barriers in your life that impede your worship, impede your relationship to him, impede your service to him. And they could be internal things that you're dealing with, maybe lies you're believing, feelings you're having. could be external things that you're dealing with in terms of the actual activities that you are participating in. They may be obvious, or they may be subtle. But I pray that we will be a people that will be a people of humility who will see the glory of the Lord. The message of John the Baptist 
is a message of get prepared for the Lord to move in your life. And when we do, we'll see his glory. And my hope and prayer is that you get to see the glory of the Lord in your life. You get to experience his forgiveness. You get to experience relationship with him. You get to experience freedom. You get to experience life to the fullest. And most importantly, most importantly, you get to experience life in him. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you so much for our time together. And I pray, Lord, I pray that whatever was of you in this is the only thing that gets remembered. Lord, that the words of my mouth would be only the things that were um, from you. Lord, that we would be a people who would see John the Baptist's message, that we would see that what he is proclaiming is something that's been foretold hundreds of years beforehand, that there's going to be forgiveness, that you're going to pardon people's sin, that you're going to show your glory. You are coming into people's lives and that our roles in that, Lord, is to be prepared for you. So, Lord, that we would be a people who would seek to see your glory and prepare our hearts to be straight, to be unencumbered by anything that prevents us from seeing your glory. In your name I pray, Lord. Amen. Thank you for joining us for Church Online. We love being able to gather together as a church family and take in church together. Uh, now, uh, we just heard a great message from Pastor Rob, and we want to help you go even deeper with that this morning. Now, in a couple of seconds, we're going to throw some questions on the screen. We encourage you to use those questions to spur on discussion in your homes right now uh, and to encourage you to take on deeper study throughout this next week. Now, another re resource that we have available for this is our home study guide. And to get access to those, very simple, just head over to our pathwaycc.net slash home study page uh, and you can download them, you can view them digitally, whichever works best for you. Uh, now, that's everything we got for you this morning. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your week and hope that you join us again next Sunday. See you.